So, hey everyone, welcome back to Data Knowledge Pioneers presented by Workstream IO. And we're again exploring how organizations create shared consciousness around their data. And I'm Nick Freund, and we're speaking with leaders and practitioners around the, the, the acute problems they experience in creating and disseminating knowledge about your data. And so specifically today, we're, we're talking about the issue of fragmented and tribal knowledge and, and how you can capture that knowledge, institutionalize it, and ultimately enable your team. And really excited to introduce two awesome data leaders who always make me think differently about these types of topics. So first off, we have Michelle Ballon, who's the head of data analytics at Future, which provides one-on-one -on -one digital training with fitness coaches. And Scott Brighton author, uh, and I think I butchered his name again. Close um, enough. Close enough. Uh, close enough. Uh, who's the founder of Brooklyn Data Company, which is a very large and fast-growing data consultancy, which, among other things, gives out these awesome T-shirts. <gasps> and so, if you ever see Scott, uh, you definitely should ask him for one of these, um, and you probably can get one if you email him at. I think it's a Scott at Brooklyn Data Company. Um, so anyways, Michelle, Scott, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yes, that is my go-to gym shirt. Scott, I keep meaning to send you a gym selfie when I'm wearing the Brooklyn Data Co. shirt. Um, I appreciate it. We, we do t-shirts like, and data very well. Those are the two things we do. And everything else is, is okay. But t-shirts and data, we do well. I'm glad, you, <laughs> I'm glad you both like it. They're very comfortable, and I will plus one that I work out in this shirt quite a bit. Um, uh, cool. Well, so uh, non sequiturs aside, I wanted to kind of start by talking about the problem of tribal and fragmented knowledge about your data. So like, what is this and like, how would we define the problem? So I don't know, Michelle, like, do you have thoughts on how you would define the problem? Like I have my opinion, but I, as a practitioner, I'd be really interested to hear how you define it. Yeah, I mean, there's like cross-functional work streams in different pockets of every organization. They have different initiatives that they're testing out. They're learning all the time. And how do you make sure that the knowledge that they're gaining via the initiatives they're testing, the hypotheses that they're validating actually gets disseminated and shared throughout the organization? Because something that the team might learn on a marketing initiative, maybe it was like a campaign creative, oh, this really resonated with clients from an acquisition perspective, might be relevant to a member experience team who is kind of like doing ongoing sales um, and kind of keeping clients engaged and retained. And so how do we make sure that the learnings that are happening over there are being shared throughout the organization? And everyone has that kind of shared understanding of how the business is going, what we're learning every day about our users so that we can make you know more informed decisions and really have just more collaborative discussions around what we should be doing next to improve the business. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I mean, I totally agree with with m what Michelle is saying, and I, I think like, you know, it's, this is always like a people, process, and technology challenge. It's you know, you've got to create the culture of sharing, you know, sharing this knowledge, but you also have to create the structures to it, the the intranets, the you know, documenting it code. Um, it, it's and just build a culture of knowledge sharing, which is very, very, very challenging. But it's like one of those things with culture. Once you, see, if you see a good culture, you, you can kind of recognize it. But it, it, it's hard to think about all the millions of components that that went into building that knowledge sharing culture. You know, Michelle, you you kind of had talked about that example of you know the marketing team is seeing something and is building some knowledge. Maybe that's relevant to the customer experience team. Have you experienced this? this problem mostly like with one team sharing knowledge to another, or do you experience a lot of like the data team sharing knowledge or capturing knowledge from like the business? Like, or do you see both? Um, so I feel like I've definitely seen frequently teams, you know, giving their best effort to share with other teams, like the product team. Oh, we learned this thing. Let's put out like release notes or send around an update. I feel like personally, and this is Definitely true for my role at like smaller organization startups. Um, the data team is super well equipped to play this role of making sure that this knowledge is disseminated and shared across the organization. Um, and it's something that I kind of consider part of my team's mandate is like, we are business partners to every different operation. We're very close to them. We know what we're doing. We've been part of the strategy discussions around what data do we want to create to answer what questions do we have, right? And so... I think it's it makes a lot of sense for our team who's already 
um, part of all of these, you know, disparate conversations to come together, pull all of those learnings together and make sure that the team across the board is being made aware of new learnings. And also, I think it's our responsibility to facilitate the conversations to get people talking about these learnings. And then it kind of spurs and inspires new ideas and new questions and just kind of gets this like cycle going. Um, So I definitely think I like to think of it as my team's one of our responsibilities to create that shared knowledge and shared understanding. And do you scope that like around data specifically or is that like you see that as almost like a broader mandate given how your team works across future or any other company you've worked at? I guess a broader mandate. Yeah, I mean, it's like we are working with the business stakeholders every day to learn new things and test out new hypotheses, validate those hypotheses. Um, and then basically, like, how can we recap all those learnings and then make sure that everyone has access to them and has an opportunity to ask follow up questions um, and have a follow up, an opportunity to have like more in depth conversations around what does this mean? Are we interpreting it correctly um, and how can we use it moving forward? Scott, any any responses to that? Yeah, I mean, I I I I, I totally subscribe to the Michelle school of thought on this. I mean, I, I would say that, like, you know, the data team's mandate is not just produce the data, pr- produce a data warehouse, or produce reports. I kind of think the data team is accountable for how data is used across the entire organization and creating a culture where the entire organization is building, is kind of making data-driven decisions, which is kind of weird because that's like um, like a dotted line type of responsibility. It's like, you know, how can a centralized data team be accountable for outputs and data-driven decisions that they're not in the room for? It's by kind of being that hub of knowledge and, and to kind of disseminating the learnings, you know, being good listeners, ah, CX team, I hear your thing about this decision. You might, you know, this kind of other thing that the marketing team um, did the other week might be really relevant. And, and so that's that's like, it's like a multi-pronged kind of approach. You, you got to push out kind of reports and analysis. You got to present. You've got to um, kind of, is part of the data team, just the data team needs to be talking amongst itself and educating each other and kind of, being, I don't know, like ambassadors for kind of the the learnings and pushing them out in the org. Um, it, it's it's you know you've they've got to be like ambassadors for this culture of of data and data driven decisions, which is again like it says it's 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 hard to do, and you've got to build trust, got to build relationships with your stakeholders. But if you do it do it right, the data team essentially becomes this like artery of of kind of insight and knowledge that's kind of you know going out to all aspects of the organization. Absolutely. There's so much more to it than just documenting and pushing out the knowledge, like pushing out the the write-ups or the recaps. It's involving the stakeholders early on in the process, right? Getting them kind of part of the question generation of like, what questions do we have? Get them, getting them excited about and bought into how we're going to capture the answer to this question or how we're going to validate this hypothesis and like really getting them involved and making them feel part of the process so that it feels that much more relevant to them. The way that we push it out, making it like, you know, high quality design and and something that people actually want to consume. And then also to Scott's point about being like empathetic, really listening and creating a safe environment for people to have conversations and discussions around the data. Like that's all part of it. It's not just simply writing up the learnings and sharing them. It's creating the whole culture really. The way I think about the role of the data and analytics team, it's like you, you become like the nerve center of like the organization, right? Or of decision making. But I think this of the organization in general, because of everything that both of you have been talking about and um, uh, with great trust comes great responsibility or great power comes great responsibility, whatever they say in Spider-Man. But um, Scott, I'll, I'll uh, set you up with this one. What do you think is like the most important like context that consumers of your data need to do their job or to kind of make better decisions, right? Like, uh, is there anything that that you think is particularly important? Well, I mean, I think just knowing about the universe of data that's available. And so I've been like super into enablement lately. And I mean, I probably should have always been into it, but, you know, we used to kind of, 
So Brooklyn Data, we implement you know data strategies and data infrastructure for clients, and we do you know we train the the users, both the the data team users, to kind of continue to build and maintain the infrastructure, but the end stakeholders. But now we're double da- doubling down on on the kind of the stakeholder enablement. We'll probably do like five, six, seven, eight, two hour long uh, kind of training sessions with the the stakeholders to make sure they really feel comfortable using the tools and understanding kind of understanding what data is available and how to self-serve. I think that's so important. Also kind of building that, you know, understanding of, you know, here's the category of decisions that you should, you stakeholders should be able to take on your own. Here's the category that you might want to ask uh, kind of, you know, the advice of the data team as it might be kind of uncharted territory. And then here's the, ca- here's the category of decisions that probably should be more data team driven analysis. And just building building those kind of the knowledge and the relationships, so the stakeholders know when to raise their hand and ask for help, um, and, and kind of to, to kind of phone a friend. One other plug I would say is that um, I, I really recommend Michelle's blog post on adding annotations to analysis. Um, I regularly send that a link to that blog post out uh, to to people. It's really cool. I'm I'm. More organizations should do this, which is essentially annotating key dates and kind of milestones so that your data has context. Because without context, you know, data is is very hard to interpret and easy to misinterpret. Mm-hmm. And then the, the 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 kind of challenge is like unless you document it, context walks out the door every single day. And when you and that's when people leave. And when people leave the organization completely, um, you can lose context and never ha- get it back. Uh, and so I think like annotations, I, I think like highly recommend Michelle's blog post. I mean, there's not much to the blog post. It's just keep a, keep a list of dates and what happened on that day and make sure that that's like a little bit. I mean, sometimes it's the simple things that, that matter. Way. Totally. And I, I think that's, that's, be, that's also part of the n- creating knowledge, right? So something that I'm big on and I think is very common now among data leaders is like, how do I become a more proactive versus a reactive team? And so something for me, something that I did like early on in my career, I would get the request, why is conversion rate down? Why are repeat buyers? Probably for me. Whatever. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, and I just, for I everyone like, who's hey. watching, Scott and Michelle used to work together way back. It was a Casper. It was a Casper mm-hmm. to work together. Okay. And, we're, and we're forever friends now. Forever friends. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, getting that question and having to dig into the data and you never found the answer. It was always like, oh, we think it's a seasonal blip or you know, uh, something that's known issue. There's a known bug on the engineering team. And so keeping a record of those logs now, it, it just helps if we do ever see a shift in a metric. And this is something that I kind of train the whole organization on, especially my team, is when a metric shifts, we should know already why that was. Even if, yep. you know, ideally we would run a big regular experiment so we could say, you know, we launched this feature to 50% of people and we know that it was hurting conversion rates. So that's why we know conversion rate went down. But if we're not able to do that, at least having that record of, oh, we sent a huge email blast that day. So there was significantly more traffic that was low quality, not high intent purchasers. And so it's all expected. And then that way we can avoid that reactive work. But it's also creating that knowledge of, um, you know, when I see this metric, I can quickly reference that change log and say, oh, this makes sense. And now we don't have to spend time doing the reverse engineering. And so you can do it incrementally, stuff. like every day too, like versus like, you know, just do it as it happens. Yeah, exactly. And it's across, yeah, the whole organization contributes to it. And it's something that I've done at like my last five jobs. So, yeah, I, mean, I think regardless of the exact methodology, and I will plus one that Michelle's blog post is great. Um, I, Michelle, I think that your point about incremental, incrementally doing this, right? If it becomes a habit and you're building that knowledge on an ongoing basis, right? Like yeah. you then have it. As opposed to, wow, how do we create this knowledge from scratch? And that's when I talk to data leaders about, like, how do you build out knowledge? A lot of times that's what gets, that's what tricks people up is, well, how do we go from like a state of zero to one here? Um, And it can be a lot of overhead if you haven't been investing on it um, kind of the the whole way. And I would just, I would just add, it's like, you know, Yes, it would have been better if you started a year ago, but you know the next best option is to start today. You know, like if you are a growing company, you're creating more data in the next six months than you did in the last two years, and so just like 
you know, don't like cry or obsess about kind of cleaning up the old data or the missed opportunity to annotate the old data. Just move forward and focus on the new data because if you're growing, you're creating so much more data to the point that the old data is almost irrelevant. I remember when I started Casper and we moved to a kind of a new setup and I was like, what about the data from the first 10,000 customers? It's like, you know, who cares? Not that, I mean, it's important, but just like focus on the next 500,000. You know what I mean? Scott, I wanted to go, go back to one of the points you made about, you know, when you're you know, at Brooklyn Data, when you're you know, training stakeholders and a lot of mm-hmm. what you're trying to do is help them figure out like, what can I answer myself? You know, what do I need to phone a friend for? Mm-hmm. Um, is that like more idiosyncratic business to business? Or is there like a broader framework that you have there that you kind of like rip and replace and use like regardless of who you're training? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it it's it, it's kind of two two indices that kind of make, you know, decide which category it is. It, it's like the kind of your familiarity with the data set. So if you are working, if as business stakeholders working with the data set, they're extremely familiar with, they know the idiosyncrasies of, they should be able to kind of analyze that without phoning a friend. As soon as they start to getting into new data sets that, you know, as much as we try the data world to make sure every single data set is documented and joins together perfectly, it's just unrealistic. And so, you know, as a data, as a business stakeholder starts to kind of join unfamiliar data sets or new data sets or join, just join multiple data sets, that's when it's probably worth raising a hand. And the other thing is, is kind of the other index is... Um, the importance of decision. You know, if we're deciding on kind of something small versus a board presentation. So I think it's just like, you know, it's kind of a two, but it's like a matrix of kind of familiar, you know, familiarity or newness of the data set and kind of importance of the decision. You know, that's when you kind of decide when to raise your hand. If nothing else, we know you run a consulting company because you just introduced a two by two matrix into the discussion. You, you know, if if, <laughs> if, if, if if you can't solve a solve a problem with a two by two matrix, it isn't worth solving. <laughs> uh. So sorry. So on one axis of the two by two here, we're, you're saying like technical, like technical complexity, and then one is like business import impact. It's familiarity. So you know. If I'm a business stakeholder in marketing and I'm analyzing the marketing data source I always look at, that's kind of, I'm, I'm very familiar. If I'm analyzing shipping data, I'm unfamiliar. And so as you kind of get to like data that you're less and less familiar with, that's when you should start raising your hand. And then it's like business impact or kind of, you know, or importance, which is not always the same thing. Like, again, a, a, a chart in a board presentation might have low business impact, but it might have high business importance. Um, and so it's kind of like important as things become either more important or the data set is less familiar to you uh, or you're less familiar with the data set, that's when you should kind of raise your hand. I don't know, Michelle, what do you think? <laughs> and, you know, answer only in t- a- two by two matrix yeah. answers are, only, are the only accepted form. I mean, granted, I've only been at my current organization for seven or eight months now, so things might change, but... The way that I've been approaching it, my team has been approaching it, is we're building out these self-service tools in this foundation, um, of course, so that people can be self-serve to an extent. I would say like opportunity sizing. Oh, we want to send this email to all people who have been deactivated for X months. Like I can quickly pull that list without being someone on the data team. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of like doing deep analysis and and trying to uncover new trends, I think the self-service tools make it possible for my team to move a lot faster. And I almost encourage more of that business partnership where in the meeting together, the marketing analyst and the marketer will like have a discussion, figure out what questions do we have and kind of on the fly, use the self-service tools together with the data person dri- kind of driving and sharing their screen, almost like Figma, but like data uh, and, you know, answering those questions on the fly together. And that's why the self-service tools are so, so great that we built out that foundation um, and really encouraging them to lean more on the data because it, it, it's just unrealistic for the marketing team to become experts in this data when they have all their tools that they need to become experts in and, and need to um, kind of own. So I really encourage more of the business partnership, the explore exploration and the kind of question generation and the hypothesis generation happens together with the data person driving the data side. Um, and we don't, we don't do as much training on, on the self-service tools. Again, 
quick opportunity sizing, how many people, oh, I need to pull a list of all these users who I need to contact or, um, you know, roughly how many people have used this feature just to get like a quick gut check. But in terms of doing analysis to uncover opportunities and then especially for analyzing the incrementality of different efforts, like that would be owned by the data person and still using those same tools, self-service tools. And, and by, you know, building that, it's almost like we're enabling ourselves to move a lot faster um, and be more effective. So, but I don't know, maybe over time I'll realize that this doesn't work and we'll need to do more training and lean, lean more on the operators. When, when it gets bigger, I, I think like, yeah. as I've started to work with larger and larger organizations, you know, it's become more and more apparent that the data team can't be everywhere all the time. Right. And, and, and I totally agree. I think when you're kind of early and mid stage, like size, having the data team as deeply plugged in makes sense. But then like, as you start to get a big company, you actually have this like, you have the data team, you have the business stakeholders, and then you start to have like a business analyst, which is like this whole new like role that is, you know, not in this world or that world. You know what yeah. I mean? And we do have, there are like certain um, evangelists on each team who are, who are getting, they're taking it upon themselves to learn the tools much deeper um, so that they can kind of be that, play that role as well. Um, but yeah, there was something else that you said that now I'm losing my train of thought. I'll come back we to it. We can come back to it if, if, <laughs> if you think of it. We'll, okay. we'll add it in post. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can, always, we can always just say that. You know, we'll add it in post and it just makes us sound cool. <laughs> <It's> um, awesome. <laughs> Scott, you were, um, you were kind of talking about your perspective that the, the dynamics maybe change a little bit as yeah. companies get bigger, right? And uh, I totally agree with that. Like, given your work, is there a threshold there where you think like what Michelle has been talking about, like truly, truly breaks down? Is it thousands of people? Is it less than that? Like any perspective on um, enablement strategies and self-service strategies given company size? Yeah. I, mean, I, I think, you know, it isn't a threshold company wide. You might find that it'll happen at team by team basis as each team gets larger and larger. And, you know, has the the kind of the resources to dedicate to have their own dedicated analytical resources. And you kind of start to get, you know, and also the data team starts to specialize. They start to become like the data platform team. Instead of this kind of data and analytics team, you've got this data platform team that their whole job is kind of landing data, you know, in the data warehouse, you know, cleaning it up in, in the data model. You might even find that a certain size, you don't even have a data platform team, you have the data integrations team. And then the data modeling team, and just, you know, at, at just certain sizes, companies get larger and larger, people inevitably specialize. And there's just more and more hops between the kind of, the person that's kind of modeling the data and setting things up and and kind of might have one aspect of context and the business stakeholder that's kind of further and further removed. And that's why just like, Training, enablement, um, data catalogs, discovery tools, sh sharing kind of sharing reports and insights in you know monthly or weekly newsletters to the company. It's it's funny when I was at a smaller when you know my background in smaller companies, I would sit there. I was like, this seems like the silliest thing in the world to send out a, like a newsletter of insights. Like you know, I look around to left my right, everybody that needs to know knows, but it, it's it's like. You know, it's a real deal. Now that I work with much larger companies, sometimes you sit there and you're just like, you know, if they only knew what they knew, you know, you start to go into larger companies. Not not only, you know, is it is it an issue of getting data from this kind of centralized core out into the kind of the the far regions of the universe? They might actually have five data warehouses, and you know, there might not even be just like one kind of centralized core that's having issues kind of getting to the periphery of the business. There might be kind of five de five decentralized central nodes. It, it just gets more and more complex where, you know, training enablement, kind of pushing out knowledge becomes, um, you know, really required. I think a lot of this ultimately bakes down to just like the, the problem of information asymmetries. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot of them, I think, around data and all the ways that you're talking about, right? But, you know, 
getting to like the touchy feely, you know, vision of like, Hey, we have shared consciousness around your data. Right. Which, we, yeah. which was like a, a standard we throw up sometimes when we talk at, like at, at work stream. Um, it's about like breaking down those asymmetries and like those barriers to knowledge. Right. And, and how do you, yeah. you know, get them to cross, you know, cross it, uh, you know, go across those organizational boundaries. Yeah. Um, M- Michelle, like on that, like, when you think about and this, this starts to get meta. So bear with me. Um, you know, when you think of all of the self-service tooling you've put out there, other you know pieces of data or data assets that you've been like you've put out there and enabled the organization on, are there like times and places where you feel like you actually like lack knowledge about how that's bringing value or like data about the data, like? Um, or that have you not felt that because you feel you're not feeling that yet because you're new or that's totally off or yeah I think it's just a small organization that I have an opportunity to talk to people one on one and I also can kind of just by monitoring Slack can get a feel for how this is being used and whether it's actually being absorbed and valued so we don't currently do any sort of um, you know, like qualitative surveys around how people are feeling about data or the data products. Um, we might at some point, but I, I feel like I have a good sense just from the fact that it's a small organization and I can kind of see everything that's going on. What are you ultimately like looking for there? Like what's used, what's valued? Um, like how are you breaking, how do you break that down and try to understand like the impact and you're being successful? Certainly, you know, when questions come up in Slack, are they being answered pretty quickly? Um, also like all of the effort that my team is doing, is it actually generating the output that the teams expect or that their team is actually able to use? Right. So basically limiting the amount of wasted work that our team is doing. And that starts with when a question comes up, you know, are we part of the initial discussion, initial strategy discussion, and thus we understand the context and we can make sure that we have very clear We've, we've worked with the team to think about how we're going to think and figure out what are the questions we want to answer and make sure that the team, all the work that we're doing is ultimately uh, useful for what the problem at hand is, right? So I feel like back before I learned how to be better about process and, and um, working with stakeholders and understanding what their challenges were, there's a lot of wasted work. And I feel like today we have basically no wasted work and everything that we're doing to like build upon. So when we get to the next question, oh, we can leverage this foundation that we built um, and like tweak it a little bit, make it a little bit more flexible. And now we can open up a whole new um, area of opportunity for us to answer new questions. So I think it's like limiting time between asking a question and getting an answer. Um, you know, the amount of work that our team is doing that is actually useful versus wasted effort. Um, and, you know, obviously usage, but what good is usage of our tools if uh, people are making the wrong decisions? So I don't, I don't read too much into that, but currently it's, you know, engagement is high. Well, I guess I have a question for you, Michelle. The, I find that it's, it's a tough decision how generalizable and flexible to make something like, you, like, you know, I, I kind of feel like sometimes I've been so jaded by not making something flexible enough that that sometimes I err too much on the side of making things flexible now instead of going for like quick and dirty. I'm not the right person to ask because I am all about spend the time up front, invest the time to think through how this should be structured up front. Totally. And you're going to save time. I understand like quick and dirty people want to answer questions quickly, but I just think if you spend the two times more t- amount of time up front, you're going to accelerate everything in the future. And that's where we are today at, at, at my company. Like we did that, we invested that upfront work and now we very rarely have to go in and make changes to our data models. Like basically any, almost anything is possible. At least anything that we want is possible today. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of move slowly to move faster in the end. Me too. But I, sometimes I'm just like, I want to challenge myself. It's like, am I being, too, am I over engineering? Am I, I putting mean, too much, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely there are people who would argue against it, but I just, I see what happens. It just be, it creates swirl and it creates spaghetti code. And it's just like all this buildup of tech debt that now you're having to, you know, break down and change management of, hey, why is this different than that? And um, yeah, I'm just a huge fan of 
being very thoughtful, deliberate upfront <laughs> and building systems at scale. Totally. I, I totally agree. I just like, I always try to like keep myself in check though. It's like, am I making this too complex? But it's, it's, yeah. it's hard. You just never know the answer. But I think you and I have experienced the, the kind of the downside of not being thoughtful and putting flexibility. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm process obsessed at this point. <laughs> but I think Love it's it. working. I think it's working. I was, so that kind of kicks off uh, one of the, the last places I wanted to dive into the two of you, uh, dive into with the two of you, which is kind of when we think of these problems of tribal knowledge or facilitating institutional knowledge about your data. Um, like, is this fundamentally a, a people problem? Do you think it's a process problem? Is it a technology problem? Is it some combination of the above? Um, I'd just be curious what the two of you uh, feel there. Scott, take it away. Well, perfect. I want to go first because you're going to knock it out of the park with the answer. And I don't want to follow you. Um, I think it's a, it's people, process, and technology. It's it's and and it's the you know the solution that's right for you at a 50 person business is not the same as for the same business a year later when they're 100 people or 200 people. It's it's constantly evolving. If you look at you know Airbnb is a really great example. You know, they're spinning out phenomenal, phenomenal tools constantly on how to navigate data, how to understand SLAs, just how to kind of enable people across the organization. They're also ripping out the old shit every kind of couple of years and putting something new in because they're a completely different company every couple of years. The technologies are enabling you to do even more than they could a couple of years ago. And so it's a journey. But but it, it I guarantee it does not happen by accident. You have to have a strategy. You have to be thoughtful. Help help put the data infrastructure. Get get everybody working on a single repository of of data and code. You know, document your document the big changes and insights in one place. Create tools to help people explore data. Train them. Create the Slack channels that anybody can ask a data question and get like a quick response. I mean, it's just like not. I mean, I. I if you look at any high-functioning data-driven organization, there's not one of those specific things that's driving it. It's the combination of all those things. And, and, and that's that's built intentionally and over time. Yeah. Well said. Michelle was nodding for anyone who was but listening. Is that, is that, is that okay? <laughs> I, um, yes. I, I completely agree. The only thing I would add, just a thought that I've been really trying to reinforce with my team um, over the past few months, and it's something that actually Emily Shario mentioned in one of her newsletters or one of her blog posts, rather, um, is that it, absolutely it is people in process just as much as technology, if not more. Um, and I really encourage my team, like even if they are not managers directly managing someone, they are still leaders at the organization, and like it is their responsibility to lead this charge and create this data culture. Um, and really evangelize how and create. How are we going to share this knowledge? How are we going to use it? Um, and how are we going to be better and maximize the value of our data over time? So, cool. Before we wrap up, is there anything else around fragmented knowledge, tribal data knowledge, uh, anything in this area that you want to talk about, or it's tickling your brain and you have to share it with everyone? Um. I guess the only thing I've been thinking about, I'm sorry, Scott, if I cut you off. Um, no, go for it. This concept of like monthly business reviews. So I think Ooh. every organization that I've been part of, it's it's very focused on the metrics and it's very focused on uh, why did this happen, right? Like why did metrics shift month to month? And I don't know that it's very actionable, those learnings, um, and really translate into like new decisions or new questions for the business. So what we've been doing at Future is is that's like a small portion of the monthly business review, but the rest of it is all about here's everything we learned this month, all the things we tried across all the different channels. Um, and and it focus, it's focusing more on like what we learned last month versus what performance was like last month. Uh, and I don't know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious. I don't know if this is an opportunity to put out a survey or maybe just a Slack post um, asking people what is the balance of their monthly business reviews related to just kind of reporting on KPIs versus recapping everything that we learned that month. Um, Definitely interesting. I mean, I think something to that is if you're focusing on learnings, like what have we learned? 
arguably that will push you forward much faster, right? Um, than just talking about the metrics because right. the learnings tell you what to do next. The, yeah. the metrics kind of just tell you what happened and maybe you can, you kind of have to get a level past that. It's yeah. I mean, I think the you know, the only thing I would add is like completely different direction is, is like sometimes I forget that, you know, stakeholders need, you know, enablement and training on how to make charts, how to interpret charts, how to interpret data. And, you know, so often we're, we're quick just going straight to how to drag and drop in Looker when we're, when we're kind of skimming this. It's like probably the most important thing is like how to make a compelling chart. How to do an analysis. It's very funny. The, um, you know, Michelle and I were at the Marketing Analytics Data Science Conference um, last month. And the very last talk was, was um, by a guy named Bill Shander. And he did a, like an hour and a half session on data visualization. And, you, know, I, you know, it's like I've been making charts forever. I thought it was spectacular. Like, I, I mean, I, I literally thought that, like, you know, doing. And it's as little as a really good structured hour and a half training or something like that on just how to interpret a chart. I, I actually think that would be beneficial for the vast majority of organizations. Like too often we focus straight on the data. Let's focus on, you know, actually how to interpret data and how to build build charts. I think again, it seems silly, but I think too often, and I know I'm extremely guilty of it, I go straight to the numbers and skip skip that kind of chapter of the enablement book um, entirely. I really like that. Yeah, I was going to plus one that one for sure. I mean, I find this, you know, as a early stage founder, I spend like relatively little time like building charts and hopefully no one can hear my child screaming in the background. <laughs> um, but I, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't spend that much time visualizing data anymore. I used to a ton like 15 years ago. And so I get in there and do it and I have like lost my skill set uh, where I, 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 it takes me 10 times longer to do anything. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's a skill that is actually harder um, to do well than you would think, especially yeah. if you're in it all the time. And it goes back to Michelle's point about um, how do you make the experience like if you're, if you're thinking thoughtful, if you're being thoughtful, uh, it's, a, it's as much about the experience as it is about the underlying data, right? Yeah. What are you doing to that child? <laughs> can you can you still hear that? Is, oh, uh, that's multiple know, children now. <laughs> uh, there's three. There are three of them for the audience. There's three of them here in the house, uh, and one of them just woke up from his nap. The uh. newborn, I can't hear her, and the five-year-old, I think, is the one who woke up the two-year-old. Um, so, anyways, uh, I. Before my house erupts, we can wrap. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining uh, Data Knowledge Pioneers. And again, uh, Scott and Michelle, thanks so much for uh, coming on. And yeah, if any, to anyone who's listening, if you want to hear more, join us next time. Uh, next time, we're talking with Ben Stansel from Mode Analytics and Daniel Menheim the director of data analytics at Dr. Squatch. And we're gonna be talking about the workflows between data and business teams and why and how they're often very broken. Uh, so thanks again and have a great day. Bye everyone. Bye. See ya.